So my mom, she always tells me, Mark, if you procrastinate so much, you will never amount to anything in life. And I told her, just you wait. <laughs> Thank you so much, ABWA, for having me. My name is Mark. And today, I'll be speaking about productivity. Specifically, as the program says, seven pillars of inspired productivity. But before we get to that, do you ever feel overwhelmed in your life? <laughs> Distracted? Disrupted? So, so much going on in your life, and you have email overflowing, and everyone wants a piece of you. Do you just hate it? No? Okay. <laughs> well, I will. I, I, I'm, I feel very overwhelmed a lot of times. So over the last five years, I have spent so much research, time, and interviews from the best performance all, of, all over the world how to improve their productivity. So today, in a little time that I have, I will share with you seven pillars of inspired productivity. Would you like to know what they are? Yes. yes. Thank you so much. And you know, for the speaker, a lot of times when I'll be speaking, I'll be asking a lot of questions. A lot of them are very easy. So just say yes. It will, be, it will, it will, it will make sure so we'll uh, have the program a lot faster. But, we, but before we do that, I want to address the biggest uh, elephant in the room. And that is, I have, want to ask you a question. How many people here make New Year's resolutions? Honestly, okay. I only have one person, Trofinia. Thank you, Trofinia, all the way in the back. You do? Okay. See, see you just have to stand here and, and so hopefully somebody say yes. And what's the problem with New Year's resolutions? We fall, they, they always fall through, right? You know, within two weeks, maybe by February, you feel bad that you made the New Year's resolutions and you feel bad the resolution didn't come through and you feel bad you didn't follow through. It's a double whammy, right? So what I'd like to ask you is to stop New Year's resolutions. And you think, okay, Mark, so what do you have instead? All right. A few years ago, somebody from this group introduced me to a concept of power word. How many people have heard about that? Power word. So you get together with your friends or perhaps loved ones and select just one word for the rest of the year. And right now is what, April 14th? I know it's not New Year's Day, so I, you can start now if you, if you haven't. So select about just one word for the rest of the year. And you're probably thinking, Mark, 365 days in a year. How do you want me to select just one word and travel with it for the rest of the year? I will ask you to challenge yourself because I believe that words have energy. Words are energy. And when you select just one word for the rest of the year, it will travel with you and you will perform at the highest level. So I started in about 2017. And the reason that I went with that one word was magical. And the word was, and the year was magical. Got my first TEDx talk, started my business, met people all over the world. Next year, I selected the word miracles. Right, makes sense. Magical miracles, Mark. I just go with that. So th think about one word for this year that you can select. And just you know, look around, maybe at your table, maybe just at yourself, and just think about, if you were to select one word for the rest of the year, what would it be? Millionaire, Millionaire okay. It has to be very personal. It's, very, it's something that s stays with you close to your heart. Think about it. It could be adventure, could be connection, creativity, exploration. This year I chose the word forgiveness. The reason for that is I think we all can forgive ourselves for doing too much or doing too little and also extend forgiveness to others. And it's not really about productivity, but I believe so strongly in choosing one word for the rest of the year because when you look back five years, 10 years from now, you can tell everyone in your tribe, in your circle, I selected this word and this is what happened. So this is where I want to start. 
So as you think about my presentation, think about your one word and how it will affect the rest of your year. Of your, your, of your year. Okay, um, are we good so far? Any questions? Okay, so the pillars of productivity are, they are all starts with a letter P. The first one is places. So the places, the reason I start with places, actually all the pillars are places, people, purpose, practice, patience, passion, power. And I'll get to them uh, through, well, my, throughout my presentation. So number one, places. Where do you spend the most time? Where do you spend the most time, your most productive time? Is it at home, at work, or perhaps a third place that you have found? Or maybe a co-working space, I, I've seen a few people here from co-working space, I'm a member of Catapult, Catapult, you should give, me, give me a shout out. <laughs> oh, there you go, yes. What is that place that you spend the most time with? And the reason that I feel just like the words have energy, places have energy as well. I have recently interviewed a Marie Kondo certified expert, uh, Elizabeth Reed from Jacksonville. And she told me about, I don't know if you ever heard about this method, you touch an item and you feel, does it bring you joy? If it brings you joy, you keep it. If it does not bring you joy, you trash it. You take it away, you donate it. It's very liberating. I suggest everyone check into it. But as far as the places is, I would like to just offer you something that I do every day at my home. So when I first wake up, how many people here have a morning routine? Okay, I have a few people here. And the morning routine is very important, right? There's so many studies that have been done that you, if you do connect and commit to morning routine, you can set the rest of your day. There's a Miracle Morning by Hel Elrod. There's cold showers. There's so many different things. You can do visualization, meditation, breathing work. What I will ask you to do is whatever the morning routine you have, make it yours. I will just share with you what works for me. I wake up every day and I make my bed because my mom told me many years ago and I, I'm afraid of my mom. <laughs> Don't tell her that. So I make up my bed and I go outside of my house and I walk around my house, maybe six, seven, eight, sometimes nine, it works. And I open up my arms and I look up in the sky. My neighbors think I'm crazy. And I look up in the sky and I say, thank you for this day. And I do very deep breathing, maybe, maybe just a minute or so. I can hear the birds, I can hear the cars going by, and the day is just starting. I greet the day. Then I go inside my house, I have a little front porch, I sit in my rocking chair. I sit and I say a little prayer. I say a little prayer for, for this day. And in just that one, in the prayer, it could be just 10 seconds, maybe a minute. Of course, it's a prayer of gratitude, but also, what is my intention for this day? And I don't have 10 intentions, I only have one. If you will see the rhythm and pacing of this presentation, I only focus on one thing. One big thing that can give you the best results. You can focus on a million different things, or you can focus on one. And then I go home, and then I walk back inside and start with the rest, with the rest of my day. So what I would like to offer you what are the places that help you with your inspired productivity? And what is your morning routine? Your morning routine does not have to be very rigid, but it has to be personal. It has to be yours, and it has to work. And if you skip one day, there's no shame. There's no guilt. You wake up and you do it all over again. Does that make sense? So think about places that create the most productive output in your life. Second, people. And you're thinking, people? How does people help with my productivity? I'd like to tell you a little story, if I may. It was a dark night. <laughs> and the winds were picking up and picking up and picking up. And there was a big mountain. And on top of the mountain, there was a big tree. And on top of the tree, there was an eagle's nest. And a storm was whizzing and going and going and going. And the young eaglet fell all the way from the nest, all the way down, 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 down from the tree, all the way down the mountain and dropped to the ground. 
The next morning, Eaglet opened his eyes. He looked around and encircled him was a gang of cutest chickens he ever saw. He didn't know what they were, but they were chickens. They looked at him, he looked at them, and he fell in love, and they fell in love with him. And he decided, this is, this is a good place to be. So the eaglet started to grow. And he went to all the activities with the chickens. He started running around the chicken coop, and they were looking for worms and for little crumbs, and they were going on all the activities. And over time, eaglet wanted to be just like the chickens. But there was a big problem. Eaglet was turning into majestic, beautiful eagle. But remember, he wanted to be just like the chickens. So one day, Eaglet decided to pluck his own wings. Until there were wings no more. A little bit more time passes by. And one day, Eagles looks up in the sky and two brothers from his nest swooping down to the chicken coop and say, brother, we found you finally, join us so we can fly and soar into the sky and kiss the stars and fly over the lakes that hold the secret to life itself. Join us now! And the eagle was so happy and he started to run and run and try to take off and take off and take off. But he couldn't. His wings were gone. So all he did just looked up in the sky until his two brothers were swallowed in the evening sky. And all he could do just walk back to his chicken coop because it was time for dinner. The reason I tell you this, how many times have we found ourselves in the situations or places or circumstances or environments where we had to cut our own wings to fit in with the chickens? Who are the people in your life who will empower you, who will encourage you, who will offer you wisdom and connection and lift you up. So that is why I tell you about people. People will either bring you down or will lift you to the highest possible height that you can ever imagine. And you can think about those people. And I know probably some of you are thinking, wow, Mark, easy to say, but there's some people in my life I cannot, I, I cannot gently vacate from my life, right? No, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> it's true. So would you rather spend time in the chicken coop or fly how you meant to be? And if you can't lead, lead, lead every day. So that's about my people. One other thing I want to talk about is how many people here are part of teams in their organization? Maybe at work, at home? One of the biggest things I want to make sure that I address in this section is this. If you are part of a team, this is the basic unit of any organization or corporation or business. If you are a leader or contributor of your team, um, what, let me do a little poll. What do you think contributes to the success of a team? The top performing team, and let's, let, let, let's hear some, some examples. What is the quality of a team as a whole that makes team perform as one which exceeds superstars? Trust. Trust, absolutely, yes. What else? Communication. Uh, trust, communication, what else? Cooperation. Cooperation, yes. Consistency, absolutely. Listening. Execution, listening, yes. <clears throat> absolutely. Wow. Well done. Thank you. Um, all of those are a must. Trust is a must. So is everything else. I'd like to offer you a new perspective. Google, big tech have done five-year longitudinal study 
within their company and outside to determine what creates the best teams. And they have found out there's only one quality that makes every team succeed or fail, and that is psychological safety. You're probably thinking, what is psychological safety? Okay, let me explain. If you have a team, whether you're a leader or a contributor, if you can create an environment in your team where everyone contributes to the pool of knowledge, to the source of truth, with honesty, positivity, and at the same time, there's no fear of retribution by other team members. There's no fear that there will be revenge or any kind of talk down or any kind of retribution from anybody else. If you can create psychological safety with your people, with your tribe, with your team, you will succeed. And the reason that I talk about this piece so long is that I feel that leadership is the ultimate accelerator of productivity. People that you spend the most time with, who you spend most time with, that's who you become. So you can lead. So remember, you can lead, create psychological safety, and seek out the best people that you can. Find mentors, mastermind groups, and conquer your mountains. What I have found in my past, in my practice, is that I always have mentors from all over the world who don't speak like me, who don't look like me, who don't think like me. And I approach them and say, what, what kind of project can we do together so we can accomplish something? Sometimes it's just for a season, sometimes it's just for a project, and it's total understanding. And I say, okay, right in the very beginning, we talk about psychological safety, we talk about this is what's going to happen, and this is the outcome. If it doesn't go beyond the project, everyone understands and we move forward. Does that make sense? So places, people, third P, is purpose. I see Trefeni over there, uh, my catapulter. She started a book club, Catapult, good job. And it's the first, first book that she selected as a leader of that group was Start With Why by Simon Sinek, right? And we love Simon Sinek. He's an American author, published speaker, right? Speaker and published author. Start with why, leaders it, it, it last, better together, illustrated children's book and many others. So he said, if you know your why, you can endure through any how on the way to building your what. Simon Sinek. And it's true. When you are so connected to your purpose, I feel you can, be, you can feel the heartbeat of the universe. I would like, would you like to do a little exercise with me? Would that be okay? Yeah. And if you don't want to participate, that's okay too. I have no offense and I will not take any. So take your left, excuse me, left or right hand and put it on your heart or close, as, as close to your heart as you can. Doesn't matter. Feel the heartbeat. See, this is the start of your purpose. The more fun we have, the better it will go. Thank you so much for playing along. I appreciate it. See, when you connect to your purpose, you can feel the heartbeat of the universe. I would like to tell you a little story about my life, and speci specifically about my purpose. And I know Trafinia has asked me and other book club members as well. And if you're not, if you're in Catapult, you're not part of the book club, make sure you see Trafinia and join. Right? It meets every week. My friend, I have a friend, Beverly, Bever Beverly Lerner from Winter Haven. And we met about nine years ago in Toastmasters. And we were traveling one day, maybe two, three years ago, maybe longer. And she was driving, I was just a passenger. And as we're driving along, Beverly looks at me and says, Mark, what, is, what does happiness mean to you? What is your purpose? I looked at my friend Beverly and I said, Beverly, I'm just trying to get home. Why are you asking me such deep questions? I respect her, she's one of my best friends. But then I, the more I thought about it, 
I realized that my personal purpose is this. Seeing joy in the eyes of the people I love. That is it. That is my overarching purpose in life. I'm very honest, everything I do connects to that purpose. I don't do anything no, anywhere unless it is connected to that. And the reason that I love to see joy in the eyes of the people I love, it comes from my childhood. Some of you probably hear my accent, it's true. I am a Siberian storyteller from Florida, it's true, many years ago. How many people here are firstborns in their family? You probably know exactly what I'm talking about. When you're firstborn in your family, you become a reluctant leader for the rest of your life. You have to drive the siblings, you have to wash, do the laundry, do the schoolwork, break up fights, but let's be honest, you probably started them a lot, like I have. And that is connected to my purpose. I had two, ch two more brothers, one passed, and then my sister, who just became a mother. My younger sister just became a mom. And then one day, a few months ago, my sister was at my house. We we're doing dishes after the uh, dinner. My sister looks up at me and says, Mark, do you know that you are the only one who taught me how to drive? She's like 30 years old. I said, I'm sorry, guys. She's out there. But that is my purpose, seeing joy in the eyes of the people I love. You see, wherever you are on your journey as a leader, there's always someone watching you. What you do and how you do it. There's always somebody listening to what you say and how you say it. There's always someone looking up to you and in their eyes, you are the leader you always imagine yourself to be. So my purpose 